Hello, 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 hello. Give me a shout out if you uh, can uh, hear my screen and see my uh, my voice. We're gonna we're gonna switch it up today. Um, so hope everyone is doing well and welcome back to another Z Classroom Live here. I got some interesting stuff today. I'm gonna cover um, some of the techniques for cleaning up scan data. So we get some questions a lot on this. So today's stream is gonna be focusing on some of those processes inside of ZBrush on how to like import stuff in and clean it up, uh, make things solid, fix some holes, little tips and tricks uh, that'll hopefully be helpful um, if you're dealing with any scan data stuff there. Um, so I see we got a few people in here. Uh, just give me a shout out if you can hear me. Um, one of the first things I wanna cover here today is that Last week, we have gone through and we uh, released a free version of ZBrush, and this version is called ZBrush Core Mini. And so this is 100% free, and we released this to kind of get people into the digital sculpting environment. Um, so especially as we go to like schools and things like that for talking about, you know, using stuff for 3D print, generating assets, talking about how you make games. Oftentimes, uh, students in that kind of age group uh, will want to experience it like well how can i get into this and so the zbrush core mini is a way to you know allow anyone uh because it's 100 percent free um for educational purposes to download it and try it out and see if you it's something you want to do um, because there is a you know quite a big gap from free to say zbrush core or the professional version and so we've made this little streamlined version of zbrush core here called zbrush core mini that you can download so I'm going to go through that really quick and just show you what it kind of looks like. Um, I'm not going to go into this for long, but I just want to kind of give you a little taste of what ZBrush Core Mini is. And this can be downloaded from our website. So if you just do a search for ZBrush Core Mini, um, you'll be able to find it. And I'll post the URL here in a second. Um, but this is basically what you start with as soon as you launch ZBrush Core Mini. Uh, so we streamlined a lot of stuff. We've limited it down to about eight of the most common brushes that people use inside of ZBrush. We also have sets of matte caps that people can cycle through and get a different feel for their model. Uh, Sculptors Pro is 100% enabled for this. So if you come across your model and start using you know, brushes like Snake Hook, you're gonna be able to use this with Sculptors Pro. And the main concept with the mini version of ZBrush Core here is to just kind of experience what digital sculpting is inside the realm of ZBrush and just play with the uh, different features because oftentimes you know we just get asked well where how can i do this and if you're a student um, you may not be able to drop you know the hundreds of dollars for the professional version and also it's kind of a bit daunting if you open the professional version up and it has like everything all over the place so we kind of streamlined it down uh, to kind of make this a little bit easier to that uh, one thing we did add which is pretty cool is we have this format called image 3d and if i just go to my desktop here and let me just show you what these look like. And Image 3D will allow you to save your models and when you save these out, they're gonna be saved as a GIF, GIF or a PNG file. And these images are just images. So if I post these in a form or anything like that, they're just gonna show up as images. However, if I open one of these images inside of ZBrush Core Mini, it's gonna access that 3D model data. So if I come over here and just say, select one of these and open it up, you're gonna see this is gonna load that model right into ZBrush Core Mini. And this is a 2D image, so it's just a GIF or a GIF, whatever way you wanna pronounce it, or a PNG file, and that contains that mesh data and you can be able to bring it in. Now, the other thing with ZBrush Core Mini is we talked about you know, the K through 12 and STEM and education. Uh, we do have the ability to export out models for 3D printing. So by default, you'll be able to load in these image 3D files, which is gonna be your main kind of saving way of saving in this application. You'll also be able to save out uh, ZPR files, which can then be opened up in uh, ZBrush Core or the full version of ZBrush at a later date. Um, but you can also use this 3D printing option here, which will export an OBJ file and then you can use that to print, send to your slicer. You also have the ability to render, and then we have uh, different uh, processes for decimation. So you can work with Sculptress, and after your model gets, starts to get heavy, you can decimate it back down and continue sculpting. So it's a nice way to kind of get into the feel of ZBrush, and if you know anyone that has some time on their hands now and want to kind of experiment with 
just digital sculpting in general, you can have them go and download ZBrush Core Mini. So I just wanna hit on that quick before we get into the 3D scan data. So stream today will appear about two hours. Um, so I'll usually go from this time, uh, which is two o'clock my time, and I usually go to four o'clock my time. So that's 11 o'clock LA to two o'clock LA. So ZBrush Core Mini, and to get the link for it, here I'll just post it in the chat here as well, quickly. So you guys can check that out. Um, you can see the feature list too, we'll have information on it. So it has Sculptures Pro, uh, eight different brushes, and then it comes down here and it'll talk about the uh, Image 3D and Image 3D GIF or GIF or PNG files as well. We also started a thread on Zebra Central, which is the Image 3D Community Expo thread here. And we've had a ton of people posting different models in this format, and you can download any of these. So you just save this as an image, right? So it's just an image file, you save it, as soon as you load it into ZBrush Core Mini, it's gonna load in that model data. But on a website like uh, ZBrush Central here, these are all just gonna be animated uh, GIF or GIFs here for most of these, and they're just image files. So it's a pretty cool thing. Um, I think it's really cool just for sharing purposes because now you can clearly see what's in that file uh, when you open it up. So I'm gonna hop over to ZBrush here. And today we're gonna go through and we're going to kind of process a few models. So the first model I have here, this is the processed version of it. Um, it's just a little statue that lives in my backyard, you know. And uh, I took some pictures of it and went through and generated some scan data out of it. So my starting process for this, uh, just a little tricks here if you guys are not familiar with photogrammetry. So this is basically what I did with the model. So I just took out my pretty old SLR camera that I haven't upgraded in forever. Um, I set it on a stool. I was outside during an overcast day, so this is a key thing when doing kind of photogrammetry stuff because you don't really want harsh shadows on your model. So I brought it out in a cloudy day, put it on the stool, and then basically I just cycled it in a circle and took pictures. So I basically just walked, clicked, walked, clicked, walked, clicked, and went all the way around the model. And you can see this is the kind of the series of images. And I took a few rows of these just to get different angles. And basically you wanna make sure that each image you take is gonna overlap. So if you think about the old kind of view masters from back in the day, I don't know if you, any of you messed with any of those where you had this little like viewer and it had a disc that went in it and the offset on each of those images would end up giving you a 3D result. And so that's kind of what the photogrammetry process is. So it's comparing two images, it's looking for reference points between those two images, and then it can establish an offset, and that will allow it to get depth information off of those two images, and then you can generate a 3D structure around it. So I went through and took all these pictures here, and you can see these are just what they look like. Um, resolution on these isn't anything crazy. Um, this was an eight from an eight megapixel uh, SLR, so your phone's got more megapixels now. Um, but you can basically use anything just collects images in this sense. And then for processing the images here, so I ran them through um, two different uh, programs. So the first program uh, that these were run through was AGSoft. Uh, Photoscan is what I used, but now they're calling, they have a version called Metashape, and this will allow you to process those images and generate 3D data out, it, out of it. And then the other one that I've used quite a bit in the past is Capturing Realities, uh, Reality Capture. This one's amazing. It's probably the, in my opinion, the best one that's out there um, in terms of grabbing image data and processing. Uh, so if you have a bunch of scan stuff and you can afford the price for uh, Reality Capture, uh, definitely grab it because it, it does a really excellent job. But I end up using these two, um, were the ones I usually use for a lot of photogrammetry stuff. So AGSoft and then Reality Capture. So I'm gonna hop over to ZBrush here. Now from the last stream, I got one more tangent I wanna do quick. Um, we did a ZBrush Masters yesterday with uh, Nelson Tai, and he went through some of his hard surface mechanical stuff. And we had one user in the chat that was asking, you know, how can I make a small brush icon and put it in my UI? Um, I wasn't gonna have Nelson go through that process because he was vibing on his own stuff. But the process to do it is pretty simple. Um, so I'm just gonna run through that really quick, and then if he pops in the uh, chat here today, I can have him 
watch this replay, and then we'll get into clean up the scan data. So if you ever want to customize your UI and you're trying to get tiny brush buttons, so you'll see some people have UIs and they're small brush buttons, not these wide ones over here. So the first thing you need to do is go to preferences and then go to interface UI and there's a wide button option here. And if you toggle this off, it's going to take all those wide buttons, you'll see them over here change as well, and it's going to make them small. So it's going to basically turn them into a square format. So if I come over here to the brush palette, you'll see now they're nice and small. And then now if I want to add these brushes to my UI, I just going to come to the preferences here. I'm going to go to the config option, do enable customize. And then I'm just going to come over here to one of those brushes. I'm going to hold down control and alt and drag. And this is going to allow me to place it in the UI. So now I just have that brush over there. Now, if I want to add another one of these, I just do the same thing, go to that brush palette, control and alt and drag. I can add another one over here. Now you'll see also as you move this around, it's going to perform this snapping type functionality. And when it performs a snap, it's going to expand the tray. So if you want to stack them on top of each other, you just kind of need to just position them. You'll feel that kind of snap kick in. And then after that snap kicks in, it'll expand that tray down. And so now I have two rows of those and I could come through and keep adding these on my little list here. So I could go through and just keep adding little brushes like this. And then after you have your brushes to your liking in your UI, you can go to preferences again, turn off enable customize, and then you can save your UI out here. And then you also want to store your config because that's going to have that wide button value there. So we had a question in Nelson stream about that on how to get these to kind of double stack like this. So you just need to hold control and alt when you're in the preferences enable custom UI. And as you're doing that, if it goes near the bottom of it, you'll feel it kind of snap. And as soon as it snaps to larger than what it is, it's gonna expand that tray out and now allow you to get more brushes that are stacked on top of each other. So little thing there with that. So I'm gonna restart ZBrush quick um, to clear that out because I did not want to save that UI for this. And let's relaunch here. I got a voice of a thousand thunders. <laughs> All right, let me get my keyboard over here to line that up. And then to start today, I'm just gonna grab a Sphere 28 model here, and then turn off my floor here. And this is just my base kind of starting uh, project here. And so I have a scan data, an OBJ file that was processed. And this contains, it was from uh, AGSoft's uh, application. And so I took those images, it generated an OBJ file for me, and it also generated a texture map. So I have an OBJ file and a texture map. So I'm gonna come up here to the import option here. And most applications now will allow you to import in um, from scan data, you can get an OBJ out. And that's gonna be your most friendly one um, in terms of uh, kind of usage inside of ZBrush. You can also bring in STLs and if the STL has vertex color, that will come in too. Uh, for this one, I went the route of it's an OBJ file and I have a texture map that's linked to it. And the texture map will sometimes give you more uh, detail than the pure OBJ with vertex coloring because if you have an OBJ file, like this one here is 29.6 megabytes, right? So it's not a lot of vertices on that mesh. So if I was trying to describe a lot of detail from a photogrammetry scan, um, I'd have to have a pretty heavy OBJ file. But correspondingly, I can get a really high resolution texture and a lower resolution uh, OBJ file and get detail that way too. So just one little thing there that may speed up your import and export process. Like don't always think you have to send out this huge OBJ file with all this vertex color information that's scan. You can send out you know, a little lighter OBJ file, but then have it linked to a higher quality texture map and then you can bring those in too. So this one's gonna be the uh, texture option here and then I'm just gonna click open to that and bring this in. I'm gonna try to ask the questions here today too so I'm gonna try to follow these along. Uh, so we have one question here asking about using poly paint to place hair. So you could use it potentially for the masking purposes so if areas are masked it would end up generating the hair. Um, you can use morph targets for generating hair. Um, you can use um, the color values just to kind of generate masks. But as for generating 
poly painting just to place hair. It will do it based on value. So if you have like a lighter area, it's gonna give you like short, you can get it to give you shorter hair, where if you have a different color, it's gonna be longer hair. So that kind of process you can do. Um, but that would be the only thing I think of right now in relation to poly painting. It may come up, <laughs> it may trigger my brain like, oh yeah, you can do it that way. But mostly it's gonna give you kind of a value of hair. So if you have a darker color or a more saturated one, uh, it's gonna end up allow you to get kind of height values in your hair. Uh, but you could also use it to apply masking and then that masking will protect areas from other areas. You could also use your poly penny color to give you poly groups and then you can isolate those poly groups and apply your hair patches. So there's a lot of things in there, but there's nothing I can think right off the top of my hair and head that um, is gonna work with fiber mesh and poly penny. Uh, so uh, Barack is asking, is there a 3D printer who can paint poly paint? So if you want one that prints poly paint, uh, the, uh, uh, let me remember the name of it here. Mickey Maki, I can never, I can never remember it, but it's the same printer that Funko uses. And so Funko's um, process for how they make their little pop figures for prototypes is they use ZBrush to sculpt it, they use ZBrush to poly paint it, and then they send it to this Mimaki uh, printer and that prints it out in full color. And that's the, the process for the prototypes. It's two, pro, two applications, or actually two steps. ZBrush, Mamaki printer. Um, there you go, thank you, Peter. Uh, Peter put the link in there. And so that printer will print full color and it looks really nice. It's a, it's a very nice uh, quality print that's out of it. Uh, but that is 100% what Funko uses for uh, their prototyping process for their pops. So ZBrush and the Mamaki 3D printer. Uh, Mr. Sampson's asking if we load Earthquake and other 3D applications, will its poly paint be there? So as long as you have baked the poly paint into Earthquake, if you open up Earthquake by, no, actually he does have his poly paint in there by default. Yes, as long as the other application will accept um, vertex coloring, um, you'll be able to do that and bring it in. Uh, so the FBX file through Z plugin will send it out and a lot of applications should be able to read that. Uh, the OBJ format will also put it in there, but the application you're going to needs to be able to read the vertex color from that file uh, to get that color information. Yes, Peter, that's it's a very expensive printer. <laughs> but it does print in color, and it does it well. All right, so here is my uh, file here that I got in from the scan data. And as you can see, as I import this in, it's, you know, it came in, and the quality on it's actually really well for the amount of photos um, I took. So I didn't take that many. If you take more, you'll get some more detailed stuff out of it. Um, but for the most part, it's got all the detail or the main elements, so there's not a whole lot of cleanup to do this on this mesh. Now, one thing you'll note that it is um, hollow on the bottom here, so the bottom process is kind of hollowed out. Here, I'm gonna forward uh, Peter's uh, thing here. It's the Mimaki. There you go. So this one, I can tell you how many photos it was. I think this is my whole set here that I have. We have 38, 38 images. So I took 38 images for this uh, model. And I usually do like a few sets. So I'll do one set and then I'll go around again because I'm already out there in the, <laughs> in the overcast day and I have my camera. So I'll do a few sets and I usually process two or three and then pick the best one uh, that got out of it. So for this model here, I processed two sets. So I did about 40 images for both and then process both of them and then chose whichever 3D asset um, looked the better at, at the end. And this was the uh, one I ended up uh, going with. Now, <clears throat> the first thing we do after I bring it in, you'll see it has a hole, um, so it's not watertight. It's also got some floating chunks around it. Now I could spend the time in these uh, capture applications to clean that up, but it's kind of a trade-off if you want to clean it up there or do you want it to clean it up in ZBrush. And ZBrush, it's kind of easier just kind of clean it up if I just press one button. Um, so the trade-off is just, you know, which way is faster for you. So I like just cleaning it up in here. So I'll leave these little floaty bits kind of in there as they import them in. They're not really hurting anything at this stage and I can remove them really quick. So the first thing I wanna do with this model is I wanna orient it kind of how it is in ZBrush's world. So you can see here by the cam view up here, you can see this is the front of my model. So this is facing front in ZBrush's world and you can see how the model is flipped upside down. So the first thing I'll do here is I'll switch to the Gizmo 3D um, and I'll just 
move and rotate this and kind of reposition it. Now, if you're doing this, wanna make sure you probably turn off symmetry too, especially if you're doing some moving processes because it will end up uh, kicking in that symmetry and you could get a distorted mesh. So if you have ever used the Gizmo 3D and your mesh starts going like weird like this, just make sure symmetry's off and then you'll be able to use that Gizmo 3D and just move it like normal. Now for this process, I'm just clicking the kind of screen space rotation and just moving it so it kind of matches the uh, cam view head up here. So just positioning it like this. Um, you can also, one trick that I do as well, like if you're looking for things to kind of be flat, like I want the base to be pretty flat, is you can use these kind of bars at the top of ZBrush to kind of visualize how that's gonna be. You can also use your floor grid. So if I turn on the floor grid here, You'll see by default, when you bring something in and turn on the floor grid, the floor grid's always gonna sit below the model. So wherever you move this model in space, this floor grid is gonna go. So as an example, if I take the head here and I just reposition it up and then click on the canvas there, you can see that floor grid's gonna snap to the bottom. If you don't want that snapping to happen, what you can do is you can come over here to the document, or the draw area, and in here there is an elevation slider and when it's set to negative one, it's always gonna to snap to the lowest subtool in your scene. So if you have a bunch of subtools and you have like the boots that are all the way down the bottom, that floor grid is always gonna to snap to the boots. And this is just one of the things that's inside of ZBrush. So you always get a floor grid where you want it on your character. You don't have to like fiddle with it. So by default, this is gonna be set to negative one. Now, if I change this to zero, this is now going to position that floor grid in the center of the world. So this is gonna be at the true zero, zero, zero axis point in the world. So as you can see, as I did this, my head is sitting you know, in the middle of the floor here. Now, after I can reposition this now and kind of get it so it's like this, and at this stage, I'm looking for a straight line or where I'm gonna cut this model to kind of break off the neck here, and I wanna remove this floor portion. So you can see I'm kind of using this as a guide so that I can rotate the model and kind of see how that's looking in relation to a straight area on the model. And so you can use the floor grid or you can use one of these top bars, like I'll sometimes move the models up here, the bottom one is the one I usually use, but it's kind of blocked by my uh, title bar here, so you guys can't really see it. But I'll do that just to kind of get a visual line on my model to know that, okay, that's the floor, I can make a cut that's gonna be straight right through here, and I can see it clearly. Now, after you've done this, you can reset your gizmo, which is also gonna help in you know readjusting stuff. So you can just click the gear icon here, you can reset the orientation, and then reset to mesh center if you want and then I can lock it back. And so now my gizmo is kind of reoriented and I can just continue to kind of modify this here. So maybe I want the chin to be a little bit flatter so I can now come through and adjust that. Also the top view is one I'll look at often for recentering things just for this bridge, the uh, bridge of the forehead, because that's often a good thing, especially if you're doing like scans of faces to kind of get that to be like in a flat position. Uh, you can also kind of see the nose a little bit better at this angle. So if you're, you know, your model's like this, you're gonna be able to see it, that it's lined up correctly. Now this process too for the realignment here is I'm completely done with the photogrammetry software. Um, if you, you can also have the ability to use ZBrush to manipulate a model, generate a base mesh, and then send it back to the photogrammetry software, and then it will do a recalculation process. But if you end up doing any kind of changes in here, you're gonna throw off that orientation. So at this stage here, in this process I'm doing today, I'm not planning to ever go back to the 3D uh, capture software. So everything that I've gotten out of that software is done, and now I'm strictly just in ZBrush. Yeah, so this was a question what program this was. I used uh, AGSoft Metashape, and the other one that I recommend is uh, Reality Capture from Capturing Reality. So they've, those two are my, my go-tos for the photogrammetry. All right, so now that I have this kind of positioned, I now wanna start cleaning this up. So this is the first stage of cleanup here. Right now this model has a set of UV coordinates that are going with it, so I don't really wanna do any remeshing at this stage, I just wanna do slicing, I wanna delete stuff, and that's it, because I don't wanna destroy the UVs, because those UVs are linked to that texture that I generated from the photogrammetry software, and that's gonna contain these details that I can then use later and apply back to the mesh. So the first things I want to go through is I want to remove these floaty bits. So I can go to the polygroups area over here in the tool palette. I can do an auto groups. And this is going to look at all the geometry islands. So it's going to look at any areas of geometry that are connected. And as long as they're not 
you know, if they're off in their own little parts, I'm going to get a different poly group. And this is going to allow me to isolate those parts out from the main part of the, part of the model. So if I turn on my polyframes here and turn off line, you can see that everything has one poly group right now. And if I come over here and run auto groups, you're going to see that all these little floating parts are now getting this different poly group. And poly groups inside of ZBrush are kind of like selection sets. So this allows you to come through and select parts of your model pretty quickly or isolate parts as you're working. So now that I've gone through and established all these little parts as islands, if I just hold down Control and Shift and click on the main part of the mesh here, you'll see all those little floaty parts just vanish, right? So it just hid everything except for that poly group I selected. And the one I clicked on was the head here. And so all those other parts vanished. So that process again, I'm just going to do this one more time. As I import the model, I went over here and clicked auto groups, which is going to give me a new poly group for every single island. After I have that done, I'm going to hold down control and shift, which is going to give me the select rectangle brush. And then if I click on the main part of my scan here, you can see all those little parts vanish. And now with those gone, I can go back to the tool palette over here and go to geometry, go to modify topology, and now do a delete hidden. And that's now going to remove them from my mesh. So now I only am left with this one single part. So all those little floaty pieces that I had on the original scan there have now vanished and we're good to go at that point. Now the next thing I want to do is I want to trim off this neck here and I want to trim it across. And there's a few ways to do this. Uh, the way I want to do it for this model here is I want to use the slice brush. I don't want to use a trim brush, okay? So I'm going to come over here and hold down Control and Shift, and this is going to give me the select rectangle. If I click on that, in here I have different options I can choose for different curve brushes, and the one I want is slice curve. Now you have a few of these. You have clip curve, and clip curve, what clip curve is going to do, it's going to take wherever this line is drawn, and it's going to smash the geometry. So it's going to take whatever geometry you have and just smash it to the line. If you do a trim curve, it's gonna go through and trim and then cap. Um, this sometimes will end up not giving you exactly what you want out to start. Um, so what I will end up doing is doing a slice curve, which is just gonna cut through the model. And this isn't gonna do any close holes type functionality, it's just gonna cut through. So with this, I can hold Control and Shift and select the slice curve there. I can drag this out, and as it's dragged out, if you hold down shift, it's gonna to snap to angles. If you hold down spacebar, you can move it. And then wherever I put this on my model, it's gonna slice through it. And when it performs this slice, it's gonna go through and it's going to give me a new poly group where that slice happens. So if I just wanted to say slice through the head of the statue here, um, you can see that now I have a new poly group there and a new poly group here, and I have a line that's going all the way through. And so now I could come through and isolate those different parts. Well, I want to use that slice not at the top of the head there, but at the base here. So I'm just going to draw this out, and again, I can position this to kind of see where it is, like that. And then when I perform that slice, you'll see I have this part and this part and a clean slice through it. And now I can hold Control and Shift, select that top part there, and now I've removed that ground. And now I can come back to that tool, geometry, modify topology, I can do another delete hidden, and that has now removed that area of my mesh. So now I've gotten rid of those floating parts and I've got a ridding, rid of the ground that's on the model there. Um, going back to another random tangent here, but when you scan stuff too, uh, I recommend uh, reference points. And a good thing for reference points is the ground. So as I was scanning this model, um, if you do it on something that's kind of a rough surface that has a lot of kind of textural quality to it, like say gravel, um, as you go around and, you know, see that kind of aspect there, it's going to pick up on those points and it's going to give you more reference points to offset from in the scan um, application, the photogrammetry application, and that's going to give you a higher resolution model. So you want to have like a lot of kind of these points on the surface. For the statue here, it was already kind of weathered. It had a nice kind of uh, pattern from the concrete pour itself. So that had a lot of areas for that reference point to pick on. But if you're doing something that's kind of you know, has this kind of similar quality all the way around it, it may be often hard, times hard to get that scan data to look correctly. So adding reference points on it, like little dots, temporary paint, uh, there's all sorts of different things you can do, but also just placing it on something that has a lot of uh, structural quality or like noise on it will also help too. Dimitri's saying the head tilt is uh, driving him nuts. Yeah, I have a, I was gonna fix it before I did the slice. I've, I'm gonna load another file. Um, with it fixed. <laughs> but yeah, it is, it is the ear over here is definitely uh, a little higher here than it is here. But we're not touching the, um, 
the symmetry on this. We're leaving it. You got to leave it. Don't be modifying the mesh because we got a good set of UVs on here that we're going to use. So don't, don't be over there mirroring and welding. All right, let's see here. So we got one question here asking about the scale of what an object is. Um, so the scale in ZBrush is a compilation of two things. And so the first thing is the subtool itself. If you go to the size, you have values here. And the second one is the export scale, which is down at the bottom. So to get the size or the true measurement of your model that resembles millimeters, you would take this XYZ scale here and multiply it by the scale here. And then that's gonna give you the value. And that value will kick in when you export out an OBJ file from up here or any file just basically from this export area. So it's always gonna be geometry size XYZ multiplied by the scale. And that's gonna give you your value in millimeters. Now with the scale value, it's a generic value. So if you export on OBJ, you export on STL, there's no unit information in those files. It's just numbers and that's it. So if you export this out and the model is reading as two by two by two, and you take it into an inches environment, that's gonna read as two inches by two inches by two inches. If you take that two by two generic value OBJ file and import it into an environment that's millimeters, it's gonna read two millimeters by two millimeters by two millimeters. So one thing there with that is that the scale in OBJ and STL, there's no unit information. So whatever you send out is just gonna be numbers and then you have to put it, remember, you have to figure out what application you're going to and what the environment value in that application is and then you can adjust accordingly. Now for general for scale inside of ZBrush, there is a scale master plugin and this one will allow you to set the scale and then you can also see the scale of the mesh here. And so this will kind of automate the process of that tool XYZ size and the export scale. So if I just want to see what the value is for this model here in terms of that millimeter, so you can see it's very tiny right now because the scan data software, I didn't set any scale, I just scanned it and gave me a mesh. Um, so if I wanted to 3D print this, um, hopefully I'll get to that stage today, uh, I'll resize it with this and then I can then export it out and have those values uh, stay. All right. <clears throat> So now I've cleaned up that and I'm just gonna go ahead and let's see, let's see how far I got in my, my appended saves here because the, the crooked nature there. All right, so the next thing I wanna do with this is I have you know the parts trimmed out, I've got the floor trimmed off and now I just wanna fill this hole. So I wanna start getting this to a watertight mesh. Now we talked about how this model has UVs on it already. So if I come up here to the texture palettes, I can import that map in really quick. And here we have it here. As you can see, it's a very pretty map. The UV on this is just <laughs> there just to get the transfer of the image to the map. And so this was done through um, AGSoft there. So it's really just almost basically like a per face uh, breakdown on top of your model and then it just applies a color value to each area. So this UV map here would not be something you would ever want to use for games um, because it has a lot of different seam lines in there. So I'm going to open this and that's going to bring it in. Uh, one thing when you import in textures into ZBrush, uh, ZBrush likes to render them inverted. So if you bring anything in and want to link it up to a model, um, you need to make sure that you flip that texture. And this process uh, is just based around how ZBrush was coded in the early days. Um, and related to the bitmap format was one of the first ones that got introduced and that one has the zero to one is backwards to what we do normally. So you just need to come over here and flip that and that will now correct that. And now if I go with my model here to the texture map area and click this here and then select that image and you'll see this, uh oh, what did I do here? I lost my, my UVs here, what happened? I swear this works. <laughs> here we go, this one. And there we go. And so now I have that texture applied uh, to my model there. And so this was brought in, imported in, and then now the texture map's applied. Now you'll notice where I did those slices, you'll see it's gonna destroy the UV in those areas. And that's okay because we can clean that up later. But basically anywhere you do a slice, it's gonna end up destroying that UV. So if I come over with that slice brush again and go straight through, you're gonna see this is what it's gonna give me. So it's generating that edge, but it's going to definitely rip apart your UVs. So if you do any kind of crazy manipulation uh, using slices, just remember that it is gonna go through and it's gonna destroy those UVs in that area. So if you're trying to keep it out of uh, certain areas or keep those UVs intact, just don't go in and start slicing like a, a madman. 
So this is what I have uh, for the scan data. So as you can see, I got this, I trimmed off the bottom, it's still got a hole in it. You can see I have some errors around the ears here, also under the chin, and these are just where the photos just didn't, they were occluded, they didn't pick up. So to get that angle under the ear, I have to prop it up. Um, and instead of doing that, I can just easily clean it inside a ZBrush. Now, after you have your model set up like this, I'm gonna come over here and I wanna duplicate this. And this is gonna allow me to create a backup version of this that I can then use to project from. Uh, I can grab the texture from if I need it. Um, it's basically just a fail safe. So it's kind of a, we're gonna do some destructive workflows, but then we can always go back to this mesh if we need it and get projections out of it. So I'm gonna come over here and duplicate that. And so I just have two of these. And this one's centered a, a little bit better <laughs> in terms of the ear value, so it's not as off-centered, uh, this one here. And so now the next thing I wanna do with my initial clean here is I'm gonna turn off the map on this duplicated version and I'm gonna fill in this bottom hole. So I'm gonna go to the geometry palette here, I'm gonna go to modify topology and I'm gonna do a close holes and that's just gonna seal that off. Now, one thing I'll talk about later, hopefully I get around to that, is that when you do this close holes, it's going to give you a new polygroup. And this is a big thing if you're trying to fill holes in the scan data. And so the next example I have after we get through this model is um, one that has a lot of holes in it and it's single-sided. And I'll go through and show you guys how you can clean that up and get a thickness value from that. So you can actually print it out. But close holes will always give you a polygroup, so just remember that. Now with the mesh here, you can see even after I performed that close holes, uh, that area, it didn't destroy the entire UVs for the mesh. So the area where that close holes happens doesn't have any coordinates really. So you can see it's just giving me this flat color, uh, but the rest of the model is good to go still. So you can still do that close holes function and it's not gonna rip out um, your UVs. It just won't have any UVs where that part of the mesh is. And so for this kind of model here, this area on the bottom would be sitting on the table. So it's not really a big concern of the uh, those UVs not being there because I didn't capture them. So I'm gonna turn my texture off here and I'm gonna switch my material to something that's not as bright, so something like the uh, matte cap gray here. And then at this stage, I wanna go through and I wanna clean up this model. Now, I'm not worried about keeping this topology. Um, I just wanna kind of generate a mesh out of it. I can then generate a base mesh out of it and then I can project those details from that other mesh onto this one. And so at this stage here, I'd come through and I just would start cleaning some of the stuff up. So I'd use the smooth brush to kind of get rid of these lumpy areas through here, especially around the ears. And this is just your standard um, just sculpting stuff. Now there's some tricks you can do with morph targets and other things to kind of you know bring back details if you lose them. So let's say as I'm working on the scan here, I can store a morph target. And then now if I come through and decide, hey, I you know clear out this neck here, but then you know I accidentally hit this part, right? So now I can get that back easily by just going back to the morph brush. And then I come across the parts that I messed up. Oh, I should have stored the morph target. I have a morph target. Hold on. <laughs> But you can use it to kind of fix areas where you've um, broken stuff up. So let's, let's see what I did here. Let's see what I did here. Okay, we got our morph. I undid was the process there. And I get my morph and see now I can morph this back. Maybe I have, huh, my morph target is acting funny. One second, one second. Technical difficulties. We're gonna restart ZBrush. But anyway, storing a morph target will allow you to get back to where you were. So if you have one stored and you mess something up, you can always bring it back. You can also use the uh, new projection history brush as well. So you can store a projection history on an undo that's older on your mesh, and then you can project back to that too. So there's a few ways to uh, kind of use that when cleaning up uh, your processes as well. And let's go back to my desktop here. And where did I put you? I don't know where I saved it. <laughs> so let's go and do that again. All right. So the close holes. And then just coming in and cleaning up. So I'm just gonna clean up this really quick and then we'll check these uh, questions here. Now the other thing too, when I'm doing this cleanup, um, 
I have a texture map with this model saved. And the texture map is gonna allow me to bring some of these details back. So especially some of these noise areas and stuff through here, I'm not really concerned about keeping those because I can bring it back later if needed. Um, and so oftentimes at this stage, I'm just trying to get rid of those weird kind of anomalies or lumps. And it's just a fast cleanup. Uh, you can definitely spend a lot of time, you know, re-sculpting the mouth, re-sculpting those areas in there. But the main things I'm looking at fixing here are these anomalies, the things that the scan of the photogrammetry just kind of didn't get. And I'll switch a lot between clay buildup and uh, standard as I'm doing this and just smoothing those areas out, trying to get those things nice and clean and just take some of those areas away. So things like this where you have a little dot that's going crazy there, you know, the top of the part here, this area through here. You know, I mean, you may want to leave this kind of stuff because it does have some of the texture quality of some of the dirt and stuff that was on the uh, statue. And you can spend, you know, as much time as you want doing this kind of cleanup process. So I think that got, the scan was actually pretty decent for the limited number of uh, pictures I took of it. So there's not really too much cleanup here. All right, let me get let me get these questions here. So we got one question here. When I import a model into ZBrush from Maya, sometimes it changes its scale. So the main thing with that is that if if you have a model that's in Maya, take that model and then send it to ZBrush. And then when it goes into ZBrush, it's going to transfer the scale that Maya had, and then it's going to make it work inside of ZBrush. Then you should be able to do whatever changes you want in ZBrush. And when you send it back, it should line up. Um, so the main thing here to remember is that if you import something in, ZBrush is going to take that value and it's going to split it between that geometry size and export scale and it's going to hold it. So if you have like a ring or something that you've done in another application and you just want to sculpt on it, if you import it in, and when you import, I recommend um, importing in our PolyMesh 3D star, so just select this and then do import, it's going to capture that scale. And then you should be able to do what you want on your model and when you export that back out, it's going to go back to that same scale. Now, if you start from ZBrush and import it into, um, say, Maya, then you're going to have, potentially you're going to have it small inside of ZBrush uh, or inside of Maya because Maya is going to be bringing it in. Like this model here was XYZ size of um, basically two. So if you have a pure model from ZBrush, this is going to be set to two, and then your export scale is going to be set to one. So that's going to bring it in by a two unit, by two unit, by two unit, and then that's going to be small inside of Maya. But if you start from a scaled object and import into ZBrush, ZBrush should hold it. Uh, Said, yeah, you can ask something about textures. I don't know if I have an answer for you, but you can ask it. Yes, uh, Comics Legends bringing up the History Recall brush. That's another way, instead of using the Morph Target, you can definitely uh, use History Recall to fix different things there. Oh, I do have Sculptures Pro enabled. Thank you. That's exactly what it was. <laughs> yeah, I have it on. I have a uh, script when this uh, my streaming version launches that automatically turns on Sculptress, and that is 100% the reasoning there. And that would actually end up going through and destroying my UVs uh, potentially too. So let, let me double check those because that that's exactly what the issue was. So thank you for pointing that out. If I would have read the chat earlier, I wouldn't have had to restart ZBrush. <laughs> it's always the fun stuff. I'm gonna blame it on just demoing. I would never have missed that if I wasn't demoing. And here's another example of the flipping texture. So if you don't flip it, this is what you're gonna get. So make sure you flip it, and then now you'll be back to there. There we go there, and you guys are getting the speed version of it. So this, is, this process is actually pretty fast um, if you're not doing it while uh, streaming and talking through it. It doesn't really take that long, but the talking aspect of it adds quite a bit of time to it. Now that I've got Sculptress off, let's go in and you guys get a double pass of me cleaning this up really quick. And we'll use the morph target this time too, so you guys can kind of see this. Just rewind a little bit, pretend like none of the other stuff ever happened. So if I store a morph target here, and then say I mess up this part, I can switch back to that morph brush and then I can morph it back out. 
and get to where I was. So it's a handy little thing there. Sculptors Pro is also handy, but for uh, different reasons. It's not gonna allow you to use the morph target, but it will allow you to clean up stuff a little bit easier, but it will also change the geometry of your model. And if you have UVs, you wanna hold those. So if you're working with scan data that has any UVs on them, you're not gonna wanna have Sculptors Pro enabled. So that is what was happening earlier with my morph target. So I'm gonna do this quickly here. Let's clean up these little parts here, smooth some of this out. And the smooth brush is gonna be your friend for a lot of this. If your model is really dense, um, you can also activate a stronger smooth. So if you go to the brush palette over here and smooth brush modifiers, there is a weighted smooth mode slider here. And if you hover over this, you have a bunch of different ways you can smooth your object. So it'll change your smoothing brush into different smoothing brushes. So if you set it to one, this is gonna be a smooth stronger, which will get you that kind of smoothing process faster. Um, the other ones that are really good in here is four. If you set this to four, it's gonna be a stroke direction. And so this is really good for wrinkles. If you have wrinkles on something and you wanna smooth those out, if you have it set to stroke direction, it's not gonna collapse it as much if you just have a normal smooth. And it's gonna actually allow you to follow that stroke for that wrinkle and give it nice and nice and smooth effect without that kind of pinch or a collapsing process. Um, you also can do it by edges, intersections. Uh, so using this little auto option here to change your smooth brush is a big thing. Uh, and then also these brushes, there's different ones that live in Lightbox too. So if you open up Lightbox by pressing comma, you can go to the smooth area over here. And in here you have a bunch of smooth brushes that already have those values set. So you can see you have the smooth, uh, Directional, which is the one that's really good for the cloth stuff. Smooth peaks and smooth valleys is great for creatures and different things like that. Um, these are also kind of handy for cleaning up scan data too because you can have it where it'll smooth out parts of the uh, noise on your mesh but then not destroy the underlying stuff. So these are sometimes handy to use too for cleaning up scan data. Uh, let's see what I got questions wise. So he's asking, is there a way to make a tree leaf with two different faces, front and back? Um, you can use the bridge if it's two different pieces of geometry and there's a curved bridge brush. So you can merge those together and then use that and they'll put the faces in between them. Is that what you're kind of looking for? Um, the software I used to create the scan data from was AGSoft PhotoScan, scan, which is now Metashape, AGSoft Metashape. And then the other uh, scan data photogrammetry software I use quite a bit uh, is reality capture. So those are the two that I personally recommend. This is a statue that was in my backyard. <laughs> so it was living out there. So it was just something quickly that I had that I could scan and then uh, use to demo with. So a little demo garden statue here. So I'm gonna clean up just a little bit more of this. There we go. Once again, I make sure I don't have Sculptures Pro on, turn on my texturing, so this is what I got. So we're good at that stage. Now, you can take this as far as you want, and basically the goal here is just to clean it up. So you can smooth out a lot of stuff on this. You can clean up the entire surface here so it has none of this kind of bumpy stuff. It just depends what you wanna do uh, with your model and how clean you wanna get it. So for this, my goal is basically to scan this in, and then I want to do a render with it, and then also 3D print it. And with the 3D printing, I want it to kind of be a close copy to the original uh, scan itself. So applying those different kind of, uh, you know, just cleaning it up enough so it's not getting those anomalies that the scan uh, software gave me. And then just making it look, you know, as much as possible to the, uh, the true to life object. So now that I have this, I'm gonna duplicate again, and I'll do this duplicated process, you know, all through this here. And this just allows me to go back to these subtools if I ever need to change anything. So I'm gonna duplicate that. And now, now I have this, and this one has this texture map applied to it. So now what I wanna do is I wanna take this, and I wanna take this texture map, and I wanna apply it to the vertices of the model. So I wanna take the texture and turn it into vertex color or poly paint. And then when I have this as poly paint, this is gonna allow me to use other processes in ZBrush to clean up these other anomalies, like these ones here. So I'm gonna switch first to say a light texture here. So you can see this area through here I wanna clean up, this through here, and then I can even come through and fix this as well if I want. And so to do that, I wanna transfer this texture map to vertex color. So if you go to the poly paint area, that's in tool poly paint, there is a poly paint from texture. And if I just do this off the gate with this model and I click it, 
Make sure I have RGB turned on and click it. This is what I'm gonna get, okay? So it took it and it transferred it. However, I don't have enough polygon information on this mesh. And so this is the result I'm getting. I'm not getting the fidelity that I had from that texture map. So if I turn the texture map back on, this is what I had and this is what I got from the transfer. And so this, if you get any kind of scan data and you bring it in, the mesh of the scan data is oftentimes gonna just be filled with triangles and it's gonna be kind of sparse. And so if you try to apply the texture map directly to this, this is what you're gonna get. You're not gonna have enough topology to do this. So what I'll do is I'll take my model here and instead of doing like this, I'll divide it up. And this is another reason for kind of cloning it off. So if I need to get back to my original mesh, I can do that if I need it. But for this one here, I wanna just divide it up. Now some scan data, when you divide it up, it's gonna potentially have the potential to make a mess. And this can often be an issue with the scan data itself, not having vertices welded. So you can have a model and it could give you the scan data, you're gonna get everything you see, but then every single edge of that model is gonna be unwelded. And if you come over here and start dividing and you have this SMT turned on, you're just gonna get this like crazy shattering effect across the entire mesh. So one thing I recommend for scan data um, is definitely you can disable SMT and this is gonna turn off the smoothing when you divide. And then now when you divide, it's not gonna smooth. And so this will allow you to just increase the topology count of the scan data, but it's not gonna smooth it down. And if your model has any holes in it, it may end up making a mess. So if you notice your model going crazy, just turn SMT off and then divide. And that's just gonna increase the topology. So I'm gonna divide this up a few times and general rule of thumb is I want it over a million polygons. So whatever that divide takes you to, this one's gonna take me to 2.7. And then after I have that topology on this mesh, I'm gonna go back down to that polypaint area, make sure I have my texture map turned on and I'm gonna do polypaint from texture and this will now transfer it. Now you can increase this as much as you want. So you can see there is still a little offset here since this is my texture and this is the poly paint. So I could probably go another one again up to whatever the next uh, subdivision is if you really wanna keep all that really, 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 really high fidelity stuff. But for demo today, I'm just gonna keep it at 2 million and you can see this is texture on and texture off. So now I've just created a version of this that has that texture applied as poly paint. And then with this too, I'll just duplicate it again. Duplication is only gonna make your file size larger when you save, it's not gonna cause any other issues, so I'll just come through and keep doing those. So now that I have this model with poly paint, you can see I don't need the colorize, or I don't need the texture map anymore, so I'm gonna link that if you want. Um, you can also do you know, anything else you want to this model now. So I could use, say, Sculptor's Pro now and come in and fix stuff up. Um, I could you know, Dynamesh this model now, I'm not worried about those UVs. So you have more flexibility after you remove those UVs from your mesh. Now with this, I wanna fix these areas uh, through here. And so there's a few ways you can do this. The first way is in 2020, we released some brushes that are called the extractor brushes. And if I come over and select one of those, this brush is gonna allow me to use this from brush process. And so if I go to the alpha over here, there's this button called from brush, and this will allow me to extract data from the model and then paste it elsewhere on my mesh. Now, if I hover over this button here, you're gonna see it has a hotkey of G. So to use it, I'd come across the surface of my model, I'd hold down G, it'd give me this little cursor here. I'd click and drag, and this is basically gonna be like kind of ripping off the surface. So if you think about kind of like a peeler or like, you know, a, um, a roller for painting, that's kind of what it's doing. So it's wherever you drag, it's gonna rip the surface up and then it's gonna generate a texture and a alpha where that surface is. So if I wanted to rip kind of the part of his cheek off here, I can click and drag after pressing G and you see I'm gonna get this. And it's gonna take this strip that I just followed. It's now going to process that and I'm now gonna get an alpha and a texture to go with it. And now I can come across another area in my model and if I click and drag, it's gonna apply what I picked up. So you can see now I'm applying that area that I ripped off to the surface of the mesh. Now this is oftentimes exactly what you need for this kind of process because you can just rip areas off and then apply it. Um, you can see with this, I ripped off texture detail and also sculptural detail. And so you may not want to have the sculptural detail go with it. For this model here, I don't really want the sculptural detail. I just want the texture. And so I can undo that and then now come up here and turn off the Z add option for the extractor brush. I'm just gonna clear these really quick. And I'm gonna press G again, which is gonna activate that alpha from brush and click and drag to capture that area there. And you'll see when this captures, it's only gonna give me a texture. And now I can just apply that texture. 
to the surface there. And this is going to be dependent on this brush that's going to follow. So you can see it's going to just take that and it's repeating this texture over and over and over again. Now the other way you can clean this up is that you can come through and you can use the projection master function. And this will allow you to basically take your model, flatten it to 2.5D, and then you can use a clone brush, kind of like you have in Photoshop, where you can pick a part and then clone it and fill it in. And then you can pick your model up and they'll project it back onto it. Now, when you use this brush, uh, or you use the projection master uh, functionality, you need to make sure that you have a material that is not flat color. So if you try to do the process with flat color, you're not going to get the result you're looking for. Um, it's not going to allow that pickup to happen. So you need to make sure you have a material, something like Skin Shade 4, applied before you do this projection process. Now, the Skin Shade 4, as you can see here, if I turn flat color and Skin Shade 4, you can see it is affecting my model some. So it's definitely rendering this material on top of the current RGB that's on the mesh. And so I can modify this uh, material some if I come up here and go to the material palette and then go to modifiers. In here, you can adjust the diffuse and the ambient here and just make it look a little closer to what that flat color is giving you. But you need to make sure that you have something like Skin Shade 4 to do this next process. So with this, I can now position my model to just kind of an area where I can kind of see a chunk. Like I kind of want to fix this, maybe fix that eyelid, fix this chin here. And after I have this, I'm going to Z plug in up here and go to Projection Master and I'm going to click this. It's going to open up this little thing here. So I want to make sure I have colors turned on. And then you can pretty much leave the other stuff off. Uh, fade will help some because it's going to blend in a little bit. And then I can click Drop Now. Now when you click Drop Now, you're going to see that you're going to be taken out of that edit mode that you were in. And your model's not going to be able to rotate. So you're now in 2.5D. And when you're in 2.5D, if you go to your tool palette, you're going to get a whole bunch of brushes you can use, all these little brushes down here. And the brush we're looking for to clean up this is the cloner brush. And so I can grab the cloner brush here. If you hold down control and click, this is going to set the spot where you're cloning from. And then if you click again, you're going to be able to apply this. Oh, maybe it's alt. Nope. There we go. Let me turn off the Z add option here. There we go. And this will allow you to now hold control, click, Make sure you have Z add off if you just want the RGB or MRGB turned on. And then now I can come through and just use this to clone that area out. Now you're not going to be able to rotate your model at this stage, but you're going to be able to come through and quickly clone these kind of areas. And so I'm just holding control, clicking an area, and then painting where it wants to go. And so you can do this to clean up those areas through here. So this process um, is also another way. So you can use the extractor brush or you can use the clone option here. After you have it kind of cloned out with Projection Master, you're just going to go back to Projection Master at the top here. You're now going to pick this up. This is now going to transfer those details and you're going to see now that area is cleaned up. Now depending on how much resolution you have in those areas during the pickup, it may vary. So you want to make sure your model has that kind of enough topology to pick up those areas that may have more detail and apply them to the other parts. But you can definitely use that process as well. So it's handy for kind of any areas like this where you just need to Come in and clean it up. Z so plug in, Projection Master, drop. Make sure you have that clone brush selected. Hold down Control, click. Apply that cloned part through there. After you're happy with that, Z plug in, Projection Master, pick up. And that will now be processed. If it's giving you a little different results too, make sure you have a material that is not flat color. And then you can also. Um, turn off that fade option as well. So modifying either of those will sometimes give you better results with it too. So let me just turn down that a little bit. Let's do that one more time without the fade. Hold control, paint that out. And there you go. So a little thing there with Projection Master. So basically I would go through and you know fill all those parts out. So I'm gonna get these questions here while I jump ahead to this. I'm not going to go and fill through all the uh, poly paint processed here. I clean up every single little ones here. So your question is cleaning meshes a little boring for you. It, it, it's definitely, uh, it, it's usually not my uh, go to like if I, if I had a choice of making new assets versus cleaning assets, I'm um, definitely go with making new assets, but the cleaning process is, it depends what you're what. Like I've already done this a few times, so that maybe the enthusiasm isn't there. <laughs> but uh, it, no, it's not too bad. 
So uh, Rodrigo is asking, is sometimes I forget to turn off symmetry and I make progress on one side and the other side is a mess as a way with the new brushes to fix this. Uh, so yes, absolutely. So the projection history uh, brushes here, which live, the history recall brush is what this is. Um, to use this, basically uh, you can select this and then you can go back in time on your uh, undo history bar. Uh, and so if you have a part where you're like, okay, I missed it, but I can get back that, you can use that and then undo it back. Um, if your model has symmetry, like if you have a middle line that's nice, um, you could use the uh, projection history brush with a duplicated tool. So I could take this tool and then say duplicate it, mirror it, and as long as it's just mirrored and you just have like that one side that doesn't have the stuff you want and then the other side has the stuff, you can then set that subtool that has it on the correct side as your projection history point and then when you go back to the other model and paint, it'll remember that point and you'll be able to fix it where that part is. Uh, one thing with the projection history brush too is you have to remember it's doing a screen projection. So if you have a lot of inner cavities and stuff, you're gonna have to like rotate around a lot and project as you do that. But basically the projection history brush is gonna allow you to capture whatever's in that same world space to another model that has that same world space. So if you just have like an anomaly they need to fix, definitely uh, you can use the uh, uh, history recall brush uh, to fix that other side. Uh, let's see what, yeah, if, uh, another thing you're mentioning the, um, oh, I guess uh, I have a reply that the uh, mirroring side, you can sometimes use mirroring to do that. Uh, if you have symmetry on your model, you can definitely use the uh, resim option which lives down here in deformation and that will uh, sometimes allow you to get that back too. But the projection history brush will also work. So we got another question, why not retopologize uh, to make sure that it's clean? Definitely you can do that too. So this, I'm going to retopologize um, and then do some projections on it. It just depends what part of your process you're in. So this one, I wanted to keep it, I had to keep the initial scan the way it was so that I could keep those UVs. And then after I have those UVs applied as poly paint, I'm free to do whatever I want to the mesh. Um, but the main thing, you just wanna make sure I don't destroy those UVs too early on. So Eric is asking, uh, is there any good streams that you recommend for beginning stuff? So anything that, um, I have some early ones you can go watch on replays that we did kind of more basic stuff. So if you just do, do a search for Z Classroom Live on YouTube, we replay all our stuff on YouTube. And some of the earlier stuff we started doing, doing during the uh, pandemic, I focused more on very beginner stuff, kind of going through and walking through navigation and processes and things like that. Um, you can definitely check those out. Also, anything that uh, Michael Papovich usually does is pretty good. Um, Shane Olson's another good one, and then Pablo Munez is another one that's really good for their intro kind of stuff. So those are the kind of ones I'd say that are good. Uh, Simpson's asking, uh, is there a way to rescale the model? Could I set this to one meters if I want to do that? Absolutely, and I'll show you guys how to do that here in a second. So Peter's asking any tips on pushing stone texture into the geo from micro deal detail displacement. So your best kind of things on that would be um, alphas, applying alphas on top of the stuff. And then you could also use geometry HD, which would allow you to um, enhance even more polygons on your mesh. And it's gonna give you in kind of isolated areas. And then you can really get that kind of um, micro mesh uh, detail on it. Um, it depends what you wanna do with that micro detail. Like most of the times for, games and stuff it's used as an after pass so it's a separate thing um, when you get close it would kick in um, but if you want it on like a high model like this you could geometry hd would probably be your best bet because you would have to subdivide this up quite a bit to get those micro details and then the geometry hd would allow you you can bake that out um, or you can uh, generate different subtools from that and then use that to bake from if you want that process there uh, but basically it would take the geometry hd and it splits it up into um, multiple uh, Subtools. Yeah, if you do a search for Ask ZBrush uh, Geometry HD, I have some that shows like how to extract that stuff, I'm making a quick like four-sided dice, eight-sided dice. Um, you can kind of look at that and get some, hopefully some information on that. All right, so now I've got this. I've got, let's see what I got here in my, in my file save. This should be the one that has the 
no texture map applied. I've destroyed the UVs and it is now just this model with poly paint. So you can see this is what I ended up cleaning this up with on this version here. So this, you can see how smooth I took the surface here. And then I've just applied that poly paint to that mesh. So this is my result. Now, if you ever want to kind of go back and forth between a model two, you can definitely end up doing projects or use that undo history brush. So let's say with this here, I've got it cleaned up. I've got my texture map applied, but if I turn off my map, you can see this is the kind of fidelity. Now this, this may also uh, Peter hit into your uh, displacement stuff too. Um, it's not gonna be your micro, micro, micro crazy displacement, but it will add another level of displacement in there. So you can see how smooth this mesh is and I have this uh, texture map. So what I can do is I can use this texture map to uh, kind of enhance the details on the surface. And so I can use the intensity of this map and then inflate off of this, which will give some of that stone quality back to my model. Um, another thing with this is, where was I going here? I wanna show one more texture thing that's kinda of cool. <laughs> so if you're cleaning up textures, um, if you come over the brush palette, let me get the paint brush here. And in the brush area, this is kind of, a, it's buried in here, but oftentimes I, I, I run into very few people that know this exists and it's kind of cool. Um, so in here in the brush area, there's an alpha and texture area. And in here there's a poly paint mode. And by default, this is gonna be set to standard. So let's say I'm cleaning up the model here or maybe I wanna modify it some, right? So if I have this just paintbrush RGB on and I come across the model and paint, you see it's gonna paint and it's gonna wash away you know, pretty much any of that vertex painting that's on it. So I'd have to be very precise if I wanted to clean things up, darken things, things like that. But in this brush palette, in this poly paint mode slider, if you hover over this, you can see I can switch modes for my brush. So standard's gonna be what you just saw where it's gonna replace. There's also colorize, multiply, lighten, and darken. So I can switch this to say colorize, and this is gonna do the exact thing that you think it's gonna do. It's gonna colorize, but it's not going to kill that texture, right? It's just applying color to it. So you can see I could come through now and colorize this texture here, and you can see I still have that underlying texture on it. So it's just adding color to the surface. And then if I go back to white, as long as it didn't have any tones on it, you can use this almost to erase too. So you can experiment with that color, and you can see it's not damaging really the the sculptural textural quality that I already had on this mesh. So that's a cool one that's in the brush palette and it's the poly paint mode. There's also an a, um, the multiply one, which will give you a darker effect. So if I have say a dark color, it's now gonna allow me to darken. So if you just need to come through, you have something that's already painted and then you decide you just wanna you know darken different areas, you can use that. There's also the option for lighten as well. And I could come through and actually lighten up those areas too. So a lot of different things there just in that brush modifier brush alpha texture poly paint mode right there. And you can just change the slider. So one little thing there I wanted to hit on when we were cleaning up that texture there that's pretty fun to do. So now that I have this, I've got my texture on it. And as we saw, if I turn this poly paint off, you can see it's very smooth. So I wanna use this texture map and I wanna apply it as kind of like a bump map to get some more of that kind of stone quality to it. Now I can preview this really quick by coming over here to the material palette and in here down at the bottom, there's a bump map viewer material. And this is gonna take whatever texture you have applied or coloring that's on the model and it's gonna view the model as a bump map. So sometimes if you ever turn on wireframe and it ends up looking crazy like this, um, it might be because you have the bump map viewer turned on and it's reading the wireframe as a surface texture on your model and it's rendering it as a bump map. So one thing there, if you ever notice that happen, that's often the cause is that you had the bump map viewer texture on and when you activate your wireframes, it's reading the black and white lines and creating a bump out of it. Now this process is only gonna be in a preview, so it's only this material that's doing it. So I can actually come up to the material palette and go to the modifiers here and in here there is a color bump slider that you can change and this is gonna determine how much bump is gonna be applied from that map. So this gives you a good example. You can kind of see how this is gonna look on your mesh before you actually modify your mesh. So you can see if I start bumping this out, using the texture map that I got from that scan data, you can see now I can get this result, right? So this is a good way to kind of see, is this texture map good enough right now before I go and try to bake this in? So that's a good example there of using the bump map viewer and then you can modify it by going to material 
and then the color bump slider here will allow you to modify that material and see what that map's gonna look like when it's applied as an inflate. So after we've got that, I can now come through and apply that. So I'm gonna come to my model. I'm gonna come down here to the masking area. And in here, I'm gonna do mask by color and do mask by poly paint. And so it's gonna take the texture map that's baked into that poly paint information and it's just gonna apply a mask. So if I click this, it's going to mask. We now have an option you can come through and change a bunch of the sliders here. So I'm just gonna go and hit okay to this and then now turn off my poly paint. Oh, let's do this, this will be a little bit easier here. And we can turn this on and apply our masking to it. I don't think I've tried this model with uh, with this option in here yet. We're gonna do mask by intensity. Intensity, not color, is what we want. So ignore that last one. So taking your model, make sure the poly paint is on. You could use the texture if you had UVs as well, um, but this one we're just using the poly paint. Do mask by intensity and turn poly paint off. And now you can see this is what the mask looks like. And now I can hide that mask. This will allow me to see the process a little bit better when I do it. And then I can go to the deformation palette, go to inflate and move this up and down, and this is now going to take that mask and inflate it. So it's used the color as a mask and now applied the inflate to it. And so now I have that effect from it. So now I've taken my model and used the texture map, which is one of the good things, if you, definitely if you have a um, piece of scan software for photogrammetry that may not be the best, um, it'll give you a mesh that's kind of decent. You can clean that mesh up a lot inside of ZBrush and get it what you want. But then as long as you have a really good texture map, you can use that to, uh, as a reference while you're sculpting or fixing things because you can clearly see those details on your map and then you can sculpt around it. There's also a preference in the render area. Let me find this here. If I can remember where it's at. Maybe it's in preferences. Ah, oh, I can't remember where it's at. But there's a way you can come through, oh, the fade opacity. And you can actually fade your color so you can see this stuff as well. So this is handy. So I could bring in that map and then now I can fade it. And so this is gonna allow me to see the model underneath it, but it's not gonna distort that texture. And then I can use that texture as a guide to clean it up. So I can come back in and say, get the damn standard brush, make sure RGB's off. And I can modify that fade opacity. And so I can just see enough of it, right, to get that texture through. And then I can use this to come through and start manipulating that sculpt. So that's another reason if you have a really good image for your scan, but maybe a not so good 3D version, but you have a nice texture, you can use that texture to your advantage um, when cleaning up this stuff too. And so just using something like this will allow you to kind of use that as a reference as you sculpt or clean up your mesh too. All sorts of little tangents today. <laughs> All right, let's see. Let's see what we got here. Go to the questions. So Theme's asking, I sliced a model, then I want the new slice to be flat on the ground. Is there an easy way to rotate the model without manually rotating it? So not really. So one thing you could do is, so since you sliced it and you probably want to close holes, you're going to get this area like this. And what you can do with the Gizmo 3D, if you have this enabled, if you click on a point while holding Alt, it's going to snap the Gizmo 3D to that vertex. So you can see wherever I click, I'm snapping the Gizmo 3D to. Right, so as I do this, snap, 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 snap. So what I can do is I can come down to the bottom here, and I know this is flat, and I can hit Alt and snap the Gizmo 3D to this area. And then now you can use the uh, kind of reset orientation on that, and it will kind of reset it back to, ooh, well, not like that. Um, it'll reset it back to the uh, where it is in position. Now you just saw that little explosion because I still had that mask on from the intensity, so make sure you clear a mask before you do that but that would kind of take that model and it's gonna base that rotation off of that gizmo and reorient the gizmo and then take the model with it. So you can try that, but there's not really any you know, way where I can go, I want this to be flat, match it to flat, um, other than kind of manually kind of rotating it. But you can try doing that gizmo 3D process and see if that works. Let's see what else we got here. So he's asking about merging two different UVs together. That's that's a whole different thing. There's a lot of tricks for that. 
Um, so Randy's asking about how I applied that bump map from the texture. So what I did, we'll go back up here. Let me turn off my poly paint. Let's go back here in time. I did a little too many gizmo in. The gizmo will also be remembered your undo. Let's make sure I get back to the before I applied it. I did a lot of stuff since then. Okay, there we go. So here's the version of the model without any of that noise or the high fidelity details. So what I did was I first made sure I had that poly paint, the colorized information on here. You can also use a texture for this. I then went to the tool masking area and then here there's a mask by intensity. And this is gonna look at whatever texture or poly paint you have on your model and it's going to mask it by the intensity. So I masked it by the intensity. You'll see my model got a little darker there. I then turned off colorize. Now this process is optional, um, but this allows you to kind of see the process a little bit better. So turning off the colorize information and then also turning off view mask. And then now I went to the deformation palette and I just applied an inflate. So I'm just inflating the model based on the mask that I created from the intensity of the RGB poly paint, if that makes sense. And then now as I inflate this, I'm able to now transfer that kind of detail to the model. Now, if you have a displacement map, you can definitely uh, load that in, which is going to give you some different values on that. That white and black is going to be better uh, than a color one. But for most parts, at least with scan data, uh, things like this is just going to be enough. Um, it's going to be able to find enough values in that texture that you have, and then you're going to be able to get some uh, those details back out of it. So that's how I ended up with that. Yeah, and then the uh, material I was using that kind of previews it is the bump map viewer material, and you can change the, uh, there's a slider in the material itself, so if you have that applied, you can change this color bump slider here. And some of the other materials have this as well, it's just one of the standard uh, shader values, so you can definitely apply this to other materials too. Um, but this will allow you to view that map as a bump before you commit to it. So you can kind of get a preview of it and then um, see what it looks like before you go in and finally commit. All right, so now I have this mesh, it's cleaned up. I've got a poly paint information on it. I'm gonna turn off my fade opacity there. Oops, wrong way. Let's go and grab the, see, this is, this is when you get in trouble when you have color bump on. <laughs> like, what's happening? I was in color bump. <laughs> All right, so now I've got this. My model is good here. This model is done. It's, it's right now, this is a solid mesh. Um, it's about 2 million polygons, and I've got color information on it. Now, I'm going to run through a few more processes here. So let's say I want to take this and apply some UVs to it, or maybe I want to clean it up further. So I'm going to take this model, and I'm going to quickly Z-remesh it, and then we'll go through the projection process as well. And then we'll mess with some of the resizing, and then we'll hop over to the other scan data that's way, way messier. So I'm going to duplicate again, once again, just to make a backup of my original model here. This one I'm going to use Z-Remesher on, and we're just going to see what it gives us here. This may be a little minute here, because about 2 million polygons. Make sure symmetry's off. Glad to hear theme that the uh, Gizmo 3D rotation snapping worked for you. You could do it with the Gizmo 3D too, but it's a little bit, or the transpose line too, but it's a little bit easier with the Gizmo. And if you guys have a chance to uh, check out Nelson Tai's uh, ZBrush Masters from yesterday, uh, he had this little neat little IMM part that he embedded into his uh, tools. And it basically had just like little areas on all the sides that he could snap the Gizmo to, and then he could reorient it based on that. So cool little uh, technique that he was using. So here we have the Z-remeshed version of the model here. Now the reason I do something like this is if I want to apply some UVs to this and then transfer that map to a UV to say render out, right? So with this here, I'm going to just quickly generate um, some UVs here. And the first thing I want to do is I want to cut off this bottom and make sure it's its own island. So we have a plugin here inside of ZBrush that's called uh, UV master and this will allow you to generate automatic UVs. Uh, one thing notice this, the more that you give it to guide and how it unwraps stuff, the better it's results you're gonna get. So you can use poly grouping to establish these guidelines. And so I'm just gonna come across the bottom 
portion of the mesh here. And there's a few ways you can do this. Right now I have no UVs, so I can actually slice this, which is gonna give me a clean cut. So I'm gonna go back to that slice curve and just slice that bottom. And then now this is giving me a different poly group and then a slice edged around it. And then now I can quickly unwrap this. Now, if you wanted to um, you know, get a little bit better unwrap than I'm probably gonna get just automatically here, um, you can use this control painting and I'd probably end up painting a seam on the back of the head here to attract a seam to, and then it would flatten it out a little bit better. But for this one, uh, just for demoing here today, I'm just gonna make sure this is its own poly group, so this gets its own UV island, and then I'll let ZBrush do, or UV Master do whatever it wants for the rest. So I'm gonna turn on poly groups. Uh, this model is symmetrical, so I can turn symmetry off if I want, and I'm just gonna click unwrap. So I have the unwrap done there. I can now check this. So there's a few ways you can check this inside of ZBrush. So if you go to the morph target area, or not morph target, the UV map area, there's a morph UV. And I just click this really quick and see this is the unwrap I'm getting on my model there. Now the morph UV also has a bump option on it too. So you're kind of seeing the model as a bump. If you don't want that turned on and just disable the slider and then morph UV again. But these are the UVs I'm getting from that mesh. So you can see as I broke that group out to its own poly group, it's gonna give that a new island. And then it actually did a really good job um, of splitting the model back behind the head. So I have this now as a nice clean uh, UV. And so I'm gonna go back to my mesh here. So now I have this model. So this is a duplicate. I've Z remeshed it so it's lower and it's got UV coordinates on it. So now what I wanna do is I wanna divide this up and I wanna project the information that I had on this model onto the one that I just recreated. So I'm gonna subdivide this model up and basically I wanna subdivide it to something close to the same poly count that my original mesh here had, the one that was cleaned up and had all that high detail on it. So I'm gonna select this one. I'm now gonna go to geometry and in here I'm gonna start dividing. I'm gonna turn SMT on this time. I'm gonna turn it off so it's gonna smooth some of those areas out. I'm not dealing with the scan data anymore so SMT is fine with this Z remeshed model. I'm gonna start dividing this up and get up to around that two million point. Now I'm gonna come back to my subtool palette here. I'm gonna make sure I have my eyeball icon on for my original model. I also wanna turn on the poly paint option or the paintbrush icon on my Z remeshed model. Then I'm gonna go to the project area here. I usually change my distance to 0.1. Uh, before I do this, you can also change your shell here and you can grow this out to expand around it. And then I'm just gonna quickly click project all. And this may take a minute here. I should have uh, done the lower resolution, but you're gonna get the high one. 40 seconds isn't too bad. And for the, the process here, also when I do these stream things, I tell ZBrush um, not to use as many cores as normal um, so that it actually runs OBS and all the chat stuff and everything else. So if you're doing this at home, um, it's definitely gonna be faster because I have crippled my ZBrush slightly so that it gives processes to other things. Wait for it, wait for it. And then after this, I'll show you guys just what it looks like and then I'll show you guys how to set scale quick and then we'll jump over to the other result. So this is my projected version. As you can see, that looks pretty good. Right, so I just activated solo, so it's the only thing visible, so I can turn off my other one. So this is the original one here. This is the Z remeshed one that has been projected, okay? Now one thing nice about this Z remeshed one is it's all clean. I also now have subdivisions, so I can scroll up and down. You see there's the low res there and the high res, and they're all in the same model. And now with this, I can now generate maps if I want. So if I want to generate a texture map for the model here using this, go to the texture map area here, go to create, do new from poly paint. And this is now going to transfer that poly painting to that map there. So there I have my map. If you want to change the size of the map that's generated, you're just going to go to the tool UV map area. In here you have a slider that controls that size. There's also some hotkeys here. So you can change this and then when you do new from poly paint or create say a displacement map or a normal map, it's gonna use this size to generate that map.
So this one right now is just at a 2K resolution there, but you can see the map that I got from that. So this is actually uh, pretty clean here. Um, the only thing I'd probably change if I was doing this, you know, manually meting, modifying the UVs is I'd probably rotate the head so it was, you know, across the UVs rather than an angle. But this is giving you the highest uh, kind of texture space per this mesh based on that unwrap. So this is actually really good. And then if I want to generate a displacement or normal map, I just need to go back down to a lower subdivision level. So you can go all the way down if you want. And then I can go to displacement here and I just do create displacement. It's going to create it from the subdivision I'm on to the highest subdivision. Or you can also use a morph target and it'll create it from the morph target to the highest subdivision. But for this one, I'm just going to do that. And you see now there's the displacement map that's created. So now I have the displacement map and the texture map. And then if I want to do the normal map, I can do that as well. And then after you have these maps, I can now clone these. And these will now take them up to the texture palette up here. And then I can export these out. And then I can take this and this model here that is the zero mesh version with UVs and apply those all together and use them in other applications for rendering. So that's the quick process there on making some quick UVs and then generating maps from it. So Saeed's asking what's the inner and outer project. This is gonna allow you, so if I come back up here to the project, there's this projection shell. Um, this is gonna allow you to kind of determine how the projection is gonna happen. So by default, it's gonna be, you know, just kind of projects from the normals outward. And you can actually have it real project inwards by changing this to inner or outer, and then changing this projection shell. So it's basically just the shell in which the projection is gonna happen. Um, the distance will also kind of do that same thing. So it's just gonna offset the distance from the things there, but you can also use that as well. Um, Paul, if he does any, um, if you catch any of his streams and he's doing projection, he always uses this stuff. I just usually type in point one and then hit project. <laughs> Just do that. It seems to, it always works what I want out of it, so I, I just usually end up doing that. Uh, Barak's asking, uh, when projecting, does the order of the tool list matter, or is just whatever is active? So it just is whatever has the eyeball icon. So it doesn't matter what order they're in here on the list. The projection is always going to go from anything that has an eyeball icon turned on to the subtool you have selected. So it doesn't matter the order. So Randy's asking, is there a difference in reprojecting in multiple increments per resolution or just one click at the highest resolution? So the main thing with the multiple increments was back in the day, this was kind of like what you had to do to get it to kind of process. Um, as time went on, um, most of the time now, you can just do it at the high res and it'll work. Uh, if it misses anything, what you can do is you can actually go through and uh, just pull the surface out. And so um, I'm, this is gonna be a good example, but like let's say on my model here it missed this part. Like say I had a projection error or maybe I had some geometry that went through or made a mess. Um, you can mask that out and then fix that part. And then when you do the project again, just make sure that masking is there and it's only gonna project that area. So that sometimes can clean it up. And then also here, um, I have a hole. Let's see here. Let's give you this link. See if I remember the hotkeys there. This one. Here we go. We're gonna send you this in chat. This one I go through and um, cover a lot of the uh, kind of projection process and how to fix those kind of artifacts if you ever get them. But for the most part, you can always project the high. Um, I always project from the high. I don't ever do step projections anymore. Back in the day, always that's what you needed to do. But now, <laughs> just throw the geometry and project it. If there's errors, I will clean it up and project again. And you can do a mass project, which will be faster. Um, so it's just preference. <laughs> All right, let's see here. Okay, so let's get to the size thing here. So I'm just going to take this. I'm going to clone it. Um, just so it's its own little tool here. And then this is the one that has the UVs and the zero mesh. So let's say I want to print this out now and I wanna change the size of it. So if you have one single subtool, this is pretty easy. Um, I still recommend uh, doing this process and show you kind of how to do it with multiple subtools because this will work with multiple subtools as well. So I'm gonna take a model, I'm gonna open up Scale Master. The first thing I need to decide is, you know, what kind of unit I wanna use. So for this one here, I'm gonna say I'm gonna do inches and maybe I want them five inches tall, okay? So I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna do set scene scale. In here, I wanna select the closest user of unit of measurement, measurement for the subtool. So I know I want inches, so I can remove all these options from my list. 
And then over here, I've got inches that are underneath, you know, that kind of value or inches that are closer to what I'm looking for. So I want to use inches and then the value that's closest to what I want. So I'm going to choose this one here, which is 1.67 by 2.05 by 1.70. And now when I click that, this is gonna now set up ZBrush and it's gonna process this and it's gonna change the, some of the size stuff in here. So if I go to my geometry value here, um, you'll see that this probably isn't gonna change much, but if I go down to my export value, some of these values are now gonna be changed. So now this model is reading in in inches. So it's converting it to what I had to now being a millimeters internal scale that equals those inch values. So now I can go back to the Z plugin tab here, and if I do sliders to subtool size, you can see this is what I'm getting now, so in inches. If I go to millimeters and click this, you can see this is the millimeters value. So I have resized the model based on that initial value I chose. Now, after this has been changed, what I can do now is I can resize it further. Now, if you have multiple subtools, I recommend clicking this new bounding box subtool. This is gonna look at all your subtools and it's gonna generate a bounding box and then you can resize that bounding box. Now, I could simply come up here and just resize the subtool because it's only the single one, but I'm gonna go through the process of the bounding box method. So I'm gonna first click this and this is just gonna add a bounding box around my sculpt here. And if I turn on my polyframes or transparent, you should see it kind of living in this box here. Now, if you notice it kind of like protruding out, make sure you're kind of not in perspective. So it should all be kind of engulfing that model there. And then I can now come through and do that sliders to subtool size. And you see it's gonna be the same size as the original one. But if I had multiple subtools, the bounding box would be around everything. Okay, so just one little note with that. Now, next thing I wanted this to be say five inches tall. So I'm gonna to come to the Y slider here. If you have this little R button on, it's gonna lock the ratios. So if I come over here and type in five and hit enter, you see those other sliders are gonna go. If I had the ratio slider turned off, it's gonna allow me to scale those different axes individually. So I just typed in five. If you use any sliders inside of ZBrush, make sure if you're typing in a value, you always press enter afterwards. Because if you don't, that slider may not lock in and then you're not gonna get what you want. So just make sure if you type in a value, hit enter. And then after this is done, um, if you have all on, you have multiple subtools, it's gonna scale everything. I can now just click resize subtool and it's just gonna resize it. You can see it do a little transformation thing here. And now that model has been resized. So now if I go back to my original mesh here, I go up to that subtool area and I do sliders to subtool size. You can see it's gonna read five in that Y dimension. Now, if I wanna export this out into inches, like I know if my environment is an inch environment, you can come down here and make sure inches is active and then do export to unit scale and it's gonna take it and export it out in those generic values that represent inches. If you export out through here, using this export option up here, it's gonna export out in generic units that rem represent millimeters. So if you import that in and it says, hey, your model looks like it's in millimeters, you can then click that and it'll rescale it. So those are the uh, kind of options there for that. But that's the whole process. So you come over here, you hit set scene scale, set your closest value that you want. After it's set, you can then you know, generate a new bounding box if you have um, multiple subtools. Then select that one, set your sliders to what you want them to, resize subtool, and it'll resize everything, and you'll be good to go. So let's see what we got here for questions here. If that didn't make sense, let me know. <laughs> so Mary says when she reprojected, remeshed and projected, some things went very wrong. Um, so in terms of wrong, are you talking about like, did you get some things that went like all over the place, like shooting? So that's gonna be uh, generated to ray misses um, and that will often happen also if you have surfaces of geometry that may have holes. So if you have a solid surface that's trying to project into an area that has a hole, those rays are gonna go right through, right? So it's gonna shoot right through that and you're gonna get these triangles. Um, I linked a, here I'll link this video again. Um, this one will help in terms of that kind of question there that you have. And it'll just kind of show you ways you can fix it. Um, so let me put this in here quick. Let's see if Restream Chat wants to be friendly here today. There we go. Um, and that goes through some ways you can kind of like fix those kind of projection issues on your model. Um, so they're definitely, it's, it's all gonna be based on your cage. If you remesh and you have a lot of areas, it's kind of weird. Um, 
you may get those just because of how that ray cast is gonna happen. Um, but check that video, Mary, and uh, there's some information on there on how you can resolve those. And definitely using the maskings, and there's a morph target uh, technique too you can do that will help clean up that stuff. All right, so that is that there. All right, so we're gonna jump over to another, I got about 30 minutes left here, uh, scan data here, and we're gonna talk through cleaning this up. Because this is a, another one that is often uh, kind of requested or people try to do a lot. So this is a picture of one of my children <laughs> when they were born. So this is my daughter here, and uh, this is the scan data I got from this. So of course, we were in the hospital at the time, so I couldn't go outside and get that great overcast lighting. I also didn't have access to my DSLR. So this was taken on a phone, and there wasn't a lot of room where she was, so I couldn't really go all the way around her. And then she was also moving, so there's like all sorts of things that entirely could go wrong with the scan um, as it was processed. And then this is about uh, as close, you know, the, the multiple ones I shot, this was the, the best result out of them. So we're not talking about, you know, crazy good quality here, but it's enough to get a 3D asset out of. Um, if I look at these parts individually, you can see that they're brought in in different parts and they just have a texture map applied. So if I turn that off, you can see kind of the quality of this here. So I have two different islands they have no back faces. There's tons of holes everywhere. I've got one with this texture on it, and then I have another one with another texture on it, and they kind of look like this. So the first thing we need to do is I need to get these together as one solid part. So right now they're two separate subtools, and it's chaotic, right? So if I try to close holes on this, um, it's gonna make a mess. If I merge these together, I'm gonna to use those two, lose those UV coordinates, they're not gonna line up. Because right now I have a UV map that's for one part and a UV map for another part. And so those two parts aren't gonna to work together and they're not gonna be friendly. So what I need to do is the process I need to do, eh. <laughs> the process I need to do is I first need to take these parts and I need to merge them together to create one. Then I need to take the separate parts and I need to divide them up and project their texture map onto the polypane information. Then I can then manipulate my one that's welded together and trans copy the details or transfer the details from the colorized ones back to that. So it's, it's quite a bit of uh, things here, but the process itself isn't too complex. It just seems like it might be. Um, so the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna merge these together. So I'm gonna come with both of these, make sure they're visible, go to merge and do a merge visible. This is gonna give me a new tool at the top here. So I wanna just append that to my scene so now I have this version. Now you'll see when this is appended, even if I chose to say keep the um, polypane information or keep the UVs on it, it wouldn't matter um, because basically those UV maps are separate. So if I apply one UV map, I'm only gonna get color in one part. And then if I apply the other UV map, I'm only gonna get color in the other part. So it doesn't really matter at this stage what I did um, to this. I just need to get them on to one mesh. Now this is still segmented, so I still have a seam that's pretty much going through all these parts, it's still those individual parts. So what I wanna do is I wanna take this and I wanna weld it. And to do this, I'm gonna come through to the geometry palette here. I'm gonna to go to the modify topology area and in here there's a weld points. Now the other thing I'd probably do before, which I should have done before I got to this step here, but we're getting close to the end of time here, is I'd go and retranslate this so it actually was lined up correctly like I did with the other statue. And to do that, um, I just would make sure I have all the subtools visible, and then I'd use the Gizmo 3D and I'd activate this transpose all selected subtools option here. And when this is active, these pizza boxes, as me and Paul call them, um, any subtool that's visible will be able to be transformed. You can also isolate it and there's a bunch of other options to it. But as you can see, now I can rotate this and reposition the model, and it's gonna reposition all three of those parts. So now I can actually use my little uh, view cube up here until I get the head facing forward. Where are you at, forward? Somewhere over here. We're flipping. Let's find my, there we go, there's my axis. And now I can reset this and kind of rotate it around until I get it to that angle I'm looking for. And this is gonna allow me to manipulate all three of these subtools at the same time. So you can use this process here, and this is handy uh, for manipulating you know, multiple subtools across your mesh. After you're done, just disable the pizza box option, and then you go back to draw. 
And so now I've just moved all those parts. So now that I just have this version, I want to weld them quick. So I'm going to come through here and go to the tool, geometry, modify topology, and I just want to do a weld points. Now you want to make sure that you're welding on the lowest one you have, because if you have a lot of detail on this and you click this weld points, it's, you're going to be there for a while because it's baking, basically looking at this distance threshold slider that's right here, and it's welding all points that are in that threshold. Now the scan data on these, they're, you know, together I'm at 353,000 um, points. So it's pretty high, but it's not in the millions. So when I click weld points here, it's not going to take that long. But if you had like 8 million polygons on a mesh and then you went to weld points, you could be there for a while welding. But after this weld's done, it should have gone through and those parts are going to be pretty much on top of each other. So it's going to weld those areas there. Um, you can double check this by turning on, say, dynamic um, and see what's kind of looking at through there. Um, that's one way, Oop, not Dynamesh, dynamic, and kind of see if there's any holes that are appearing. Uh, if not, if there are holes, you need to go to modify topology, increase that weld distance and weld again. Uh, after you have this, we can now start cleaning up some of the mesh too. And so it's gonna be the same process we did before with the slicing and also the auto grouping. So I'm gonna go back to the tool pal at the top. I'm gonna go down to the polygroups area here. I'm gonna do an auto groups and you can turn on your polyframes here. And I wanna make sure that this gets any floating geometry. So if I turn this on, you'll see that this part here is its own island, so I wanna get rid of that. So once again, I just did auto groups. It's gonna give all those geometry islands a new polygroup. Then I can hold control and shift, make sure I have the select rectangle brush selected, select that main part. It's gonna hide all those little floating pieces. Then I go to geometry, modify topology, and delete hidden, and that will remove all those. Now for the rest of the stuff, I really just want to capture kind of this area in between here. So I'm going to go back to that slice curve brush and I'm just going to start slicing. And you can see as I slice through these areas, it's going to start giving me new polygroups. And basically I'm just slicing through because I want basically like a, a box shape out of this. And then I can hold control and shift with that select rectangle brush, isolate those parts out, do another delete hidden. I can then slice, say, the bottom part here to maybe frame this up a little bit more like that, isolate that part, and then delete hidden. And as you see, now I can start you know, cleaning up that just a little bit more. Now at this stage, um, you can see there's still quite a bit of holes through here. And if I want to 3D print this, I have to come through and figure out how to fix these holes. So the main process for this is I'm going to do a close holes function. And we talked about earlier when I did close holes, um, if you do it on a model like this, it's probably not going to give you what you want. But the key thing to note here is when you close holes, you're going to get this nice polygroup. And this nice polygroup you can then use to your advantage. So if I come to the Geometry tab, go to Modify Topology, and now do Close Holes, you're going to see the madness it's going to give me, right? So if I turn on Double down here in the Display Options, you're going to see what's happening, right? So it's basically not closed anything really what I wanted, and now I have this mess. It closed the holes, it did exactly what it was supposed to do, but it's not what I want. Like, there's no way I could 3D print this, it's kind of making a mess of everything. So what I wanna do is I wanna isolate or mask this polygroup, and then I can use this polygroup and pull it out. And as I pull it out, it's gonna give me thickness. And then after I have that thickness, I can then dynamesh or remesh by union, and it's gonna solidify everything up, and then I can project the color information back from those other models onto this one, and now I'm gonna have a solid mesh with everything I want. So I'm gonna hold Control and Shift again, I'm gonna select the select rectangle brush, grab that green part there, and I'm just gonna come through and drag this out to give me that mask, I'm gonna flip it. So I just have, well, well give me my mask first, bring everything back, flip it, so now I just have the close holes selected. You could also use the uh, Gizmo 3D with control when you click on that polygroup, will give you the same kind of thing. Then I can use move, and I wanna make sure that my Gizmo 3D is aligned first. And as I'm doing this, if you just pull, you see it's gonna pull this off. Now you can also do this with control, and if you hold control and pull, you're seeing you're not gonna get as much striations. So if I just do it without control, you can see how these edges are rough. But if I hold control, it's gonna give me an extrude, and now I'm pulling that back. And you can see as I pull that back, I'm getting this solid shape, right? So it's solidifying all those little holes. Now there's still some anomalies in here, like I have stuff like this, but it's giving me more to work from than I had. 
And basically you wanna make sure that you pull this out far enough where this kind of stuff is well beyond where the areas you wanna keep. So I'm holding control and pulling and I just wanna pull it out. So something like that. Now after I have this pulled out, now I can slice this again or I can dynamesh at this stage. So I can come through and we'll do a trim curve this time. And just trim this. And now it's came through and done that. Now these parts are still going through, but you can see now it's giving me a solid shape. So now with this solid, I got some poly painting on here and you turn off. Or masking rather. I can now dynamesh this. And here I just need to get just any dynamesh resolution that's gonna kind of hold some of these details. So I don't have to be perfect. And you can see as I dynamesh that, it cleaned it up. I can do the same process again down here if I wanna clean up this entire edge, but we're just gonna keep that the way it is for now. And then for these kind of anomalies through here, I'm just gonna come through and smooth these out and sculpt these away, so using shift. If you ever come across areas of your model too that aren't smoothing, like you see this little point right here, if I keep trying to smooth it, it's not doing anything. This is because there may actually be a hole that's there or you have a point that is only connected by like two vertices and it's not connected by enough to allow the smoothing brush to kick in and use what it normally does. So if you come back to your brush palette over here in the smooth area, there is a min connected points slider here and I can change this lower and then if I do that, I'll be able to smooth that point out. So if you ever come across anything that's like that and it's giving you a little trouble, um, you can do that. You can also use the alternate smooth, which is if you hold shift and smooth and then release, it'll do a relax. And then you can always come in and you know, sculpt it out and smooth it too. But that's another way you can kind of get rid of any kind of geometry anomalies like that. Now at this stage, I'd probably do a lot of cleanup on the model here. Um, for this demo, I'm just gonna do some quick things, just removing some holes. And then now I come back up here and I have my two parts that have that color information and these are still separate. So what I wanna do with these, I wanna take this color information and I wanna bake it into the vertices of that part. Because if I try to do a project now, it's just going from texture to poly paint and that's not gonna work. So I need to take the texture and apply it to the poly paint and then I can transfer the poly paint to the other model. So with this child here, I'm going to now go to my geometry area, and I'm gonna divide this up because I don't have enough geometry again for this part to give me that resolution to hold that texture detail. So I'm gonna turn SMT off and divide this up. Once again, getting our over a little one million there. Go to the second part and do the same thing. So turn SMT off and divide, and we'll get over a million on that one. That one's too high, we'll do a little bit lower for the demo here. Now that I have those two sets, I can now transfer the texture map to the poly paint. So I'm gonna go make sure I have the texture map turned on, go to the poly paint area, do poly paint from texture, and that should now be there. I'm gonna press the down arrow instead of going back up to the subtool. If you press up and down on your keyboard, it'll allow you to scroll through subtools. Sometimes it's a little bit faster than scrolling up and down this tool palette. Do the same thing on this one, poly paint from texture. So now that has the colorized information in it. And if I get out a solo, now I have both these tools with poly paint information. So now the next thing I wanna do is I wanna go back to my merged version here. We're gonna store a, actually we're gonna divide up some because I wanna get a little more polygons than this. So divide this up a little bit, so around a million. Now I'm gonna store a morph target on this and this will be used for cleanup. And then I'll make the eyeball icons on for those parts that we transferred that texture map to that poly paint information. I'm now gonna go to the project area here I like to do the distance of 0.1 and then do a project all. If you get a little dialogue that pops up and asks you if you wanna project the poly painting, yes we do, by all means. So we're gonna hit yes to that and this will now project. And let me look at these questions here while this is doing that. And your projection is gonna be based on how many polygons you have. So this one, it's going to three million and also it has a lot of those kind of thin pieces, so. This may take a minute here. Let's see what questions we got here. Oh man, the virus is sending me images. This better not be, this better be something that's safe. <laughs> As I open this. So what you're looking at there in that image, that is the um, retopology function. So it's a Z-sphere topology is what you're looking at there. And that is, 
the points of z-spheres that are generating topology. Uh, I may have a video on that, but it's basically um, retopologizing re using z-spheres. So z-sphere topology is what that image is from. Uh, uh, Aram's asking, is it a z-sphere? Which I'm not, oh, the uh, yes, it definitely is a z-sphere topology. So Mary's asking why sometimes closed holes does not work very well, because basically the closed holes function needs something to close to. So that the mesh I had when I did that closed holes, it was perfectly uh, correct. It's just that if you have something and it's a hole, and if it, one area is kind of like lower than the other, it's gonna fill like this. So it's not gonna fill like this, like you kind of expect it to, because it doesn't know you wanna do this. And so that's the main kind of thing there. So it's gonna fill the holes because all it's trying to do is close holes. And so if you have say like an edge like this and you're like, I wanna fill this and in your head you want it to fill as a box, it's not, it's gonna fill like this because it doesn't know that you want it as a box. So that's the main thing with kind of close holes um, for that. I'm partially human. <laughs> I don't get a lot of sun. I don't know if <laughs> that may have something to do with it. All right. All right, so you can see here's the projection I got. And you'll notice that since that area is, you know, as I had that kind of, um, these parts I had originally, they're kind of shooting off, right? They were a lot larger in this one. So these are some of those kind of projecting things that Mary, you may be having too when you're talking about things going crazy. And as you can see, I got the projection, I got the color, and then I've got some offset stuff going here. And this is one of the reasons why I saved that morph target off the start, because now, as long as you don't have Sculptures Pro on, I can now switch to this morph target. And I can go along these edges, and it's just gonna morph them back. So it's gonna clean it back right up to where it was before I did the projection. Now I also could have just masked out part of those areas too, um, and then also you know, just projected in that one area that was unmasked. But if you are ever using a lot of projections, it's handy to uh, do the morph target. You can also disable the um, RGB stuff too, and then that won't rip up your texture if you're concerned about that. So you can see with it off now, I can clean these edges up. The projection all should still be correct um, in terms of what it did, but the, uh, just the raycast for the sculptural stuff uh, went a little crazy because I had all that floating geometry off in space. But if you turn morph target, you store morph target, you can come in, you can see I can morph this right back to where it was and then clean that up. So that's a handy thing. Morph targeting is especially very handy if you're doing any kind of projections because it's very easy to use this to clean it up. And then you can also use it with visibility. So if you have something that's like really crazy internal, um, you can just hide part of your model and then use the morph target and fix it and then bring it back. But that's the uh, quick thing there. So now I've got this model here. We'll see what it looks like with um, say the bump map viewer. So you probably wanna spend a lot more time cleaning this up, but that was the kind of quick rundown on how you can take a really, really, really messy uh, piece of scan data that has no back facings and multiple parts and how you can go and make it solid uh, using that Dynamesh process, using the projections. And then after it's solid, now you can 3D print this. So this is, this is ready now for uh, print. Um, you probably wanna do a little more sculpting and cleanup, but that's the, the quick and dirty on that process. So we got about nine minutes left, not much time. Um, so if you guys have any quick questions um, about any of the stuff I covered, I may be able to answer them quickly. If not, we're gonna go into our last minute spiels here. So thank you all for showing up and I hope some of this information helps because these are some of the things that I get asked quite a bit about for scan data stuff. And so I wanted to do just a stream that was focused on it because um, it's really not, I mean, it's kind of technical. <laughs> But after you do it once, you're kind of going to remember how to do it and you can do it again. And it's all the same kind of processes. The main things to kind of look out for is, you know, keeping your UVs so don't distort your mesh, you know, early on if you have those. And then to do any transferring of color, make sure you take those texture maps and bake it into poly paint. And then after it's in poly paint, you can do what you want. And then closing holes is um, definitely the big thing and using this close hole function, but then pulling it off to give you a solid volume. Uh, you can also go through and fill it with pieces of geometry. Um, that also helps too, because you wanna make sure stuff's watertight. And so you can fill a hole with a piece of geometry. You can, I could take in this model and basically uh, for this initial part here, 
I could have built a box around it to kind of engulf the areas I want, but using that close those function is a little bit faster. But definitely you could do something like that and then do projections to get the offset. So there's a bunch of ways to do it. Um, I just showed you the ways that I end up doing it. So the projecting the, Brock's asking about the projecting the paint process. So basically with that, I took each of these parts. So this was part A and then part B. And on each of these, I initially just had a texture map applied to it. So I only had a texture map. And in order to get this to transfer to my other tool, I needed to take the texture map and then convert it to polypaint. And so I used the polypaint from texture option here, but before I could use the polypaint from texture to transfer that texture map to vertex coloring, this is very similar to what we did with the statue, I need to make sure I divided that mesh part up. So I went to the geometry palette here I turned off SMT because I didn't want to distort that scan mesh. I just wanted to add topology to it. And then I just divided it up and that gave me enough resolution that I could then use the poly paint from texture, which took the texture, applied it to the um, poly vertices, the vertex color of the model. And I did that for both of those parts. So I did it for this one and this one. And so both of these subtools now are existing in mesh data and vertex color. And then after I have these set, I went back to my other model here. So this version of it, let's go back in time. Before the cleaning, this version, I made sure that I had the poly paint option on, and then I did a project and made sure I had these two subtools with their eyeball icon turned on, set my distance to 0.1 and did a project all. This went through and projected the color information and mesh data from these two subtools onto this subtool. And then I stored a morph target before all this too. I'm out of, <laughs> and then I was able to then clean that up. Um, but basically it's just projecting vertex color from vertex color. But since my original pieces didn't have vertex color, I need to divide them up, apply the poly paint from the texture and then transfer it. So, Hopefully, it's, it's a lot to uh, kind of describe, but it is recorded. You can watch it multiple times. It'll be on YouTube later. Um, you can scroll through it. <laughs> All right, let's see what else I got here. Sometimes when I'm creating my creations, undo history stops recording. So there is a calling process that undo history will do. It shouldn't like just stop recording, um, but there is a um, max undo history here that's set in this preferences. Also the uh, size of it too. So if you hit that kind of limit, um, it may give you a warning about removing it. Um, you can also add compression to your undo. So there's a few things in here you can kind of tweak in your settings to kind of get undo history uh, kind of retained. I always work most of the time with ZTL files and ZTL files are saved through this load tool menu up here and they don't contain any undo history. Um, so I just usually, I don't, I use undo history in the session I'm in, but I never end up really using it afterwards. Um, there's also, if you have your file and you save it and this is turned off, it also will remove your undo history too. And there's also a preferences in here as well in preference undo history that will skip the loading. So there's a few ways you could, you know, not have your undo history working if you really want it. Um, if you have any, the skip loading enabled or you have your ZPR file with this turned off, it won't save that undo history either. But it shouldn't just be stopping unless you're running out of undo history. Like basically it's hitting that memory cap of undo history and it's, and it's just removing them like so. Uh, we got a question on placing alpha patterns on UVs or after transferring details. Uh, if you have the UVs, that's your best way to do the alpha patterns. Make sure your mesh has UVs and then you can transfer them there. Um, then you can apply them. If you, after you have them applied, you can bake them, you can morph them, you can project. Like if, you, if I had one tool that had UVs on it and I had some details on that, I could use that to obtain some details and I could project it to another mesh and then erase it out with a morph target or the uh, project the history recall brush. So there's a lot of functionality, um, but basically to apply it initially for any patterns, I'd um, do it with UVs. Um, let's see what else. Uh, so Mosin for using the ZBrush at home, basically you just need to use the hashtag ZBrush at home and we, uh, some of our marketing guys will end up coming through and looking at it. So here's some examples. This is just on Twitter and they're just using hashtag ZBrush at home. Um, so you can see some of the examples of stuff that people have been doing using that hashtag. So it's just a simple hashtag that we are asking guys to use on uh, Twitter and Instagram. 
Uh, final things, uh, if you ever have any other questions on stuff, uh, there's a lot of these Ask ZBrush videos I end up doing, and some of them cover a lot of the kind of things that you guys may have questions on. Uh, if you're looking for something and you can't find it, it may just be the way I described it, uh, so sometimes it could be weird. Um, but if you search, I try to put enough tags in a lot of these so that if you search kind of anything kind of global, you'll probably stumble on it. But there is, I think we're up to almost 400 of these now. Um, so the, pro the main goal of these is to kind of answer or help you guys find those questions. So you can definitely just search YouTube for stuff like that. And usually I have at least some video on it. Um, also, the um, other thing that I just want to hit on once again is that we did release a free version of ZBrush last week called ZBrush Core Mini. ZBrush Core Mini is free for educational usage, and so it contains a very mini set of tools that will allow you to experience digital sculpting inside of ZBrush and absolutely free. So if you have anyone that may be interested in digital sculpting, maybe they don't even have a pen tablet yet, like one of these kind of Wacom devices I'm using here. Uh, there's no charge, no cost for them to download this version of ZBrush and play with it. It works with a mouse as well, so you can definitely try it out and see if it's something you're interested in before taking a leap into say ZBrush Core or even the professional version of ZBrush. Um, we've done a one stream on kind of using it. Uh, it also has a introduction of this thing called Image 3D, which is a image file that also contains vertex or it contains model data. And so if you save out a file by default out of ZBrush Core Mini, it's gonna generate a PNG or a GIF or GIF file. And then these are just your standard image formats. So if you drag these to a form like ZBrush Central here, they're just gonna appear as an image. But if you take this image and load it into ZBrush Core Mini, it's gonna load model data. So it's pretty cool. It's like, it's got your model hidden in an image and you can post this image online and other places and then you can transfer your files this way. It also gives you a nice view of what the model looks like before you even open it. So in the past with our ZPR, which are project files and ZTLs, they're often just extensions. So you don't really know what's in the file unless you browse through Lightbox with them. And now with this, with this image 3D uh, GIF, GIF or PNG format, um, you can end up seeing your file there. All right, uh, let's see what else we got here. So Mary's asking, is there any configuration for using GPU in ZBrush? So no, unfortunately. Um, Polygroup it, some of the plugins we have will end up using the GPU, but ZBrush is entirely CPU. And that's one of the kind of uh, powers it has uh, in terms of getting the ability to render the millions of polygons that it does. Um, some of those models could not be loaded on a GPU. So someday, maybe, but not, not currently right now. Theme's asking to bring ZBrush Core Mini to the iPad. I'd like it on an iPad, definitely, for sure. So Mr. Sampson is asking one last question here. Uh, if you need to save the model differently to preserve the vertex colors, so no. So the vertex colors is gonna just be standard with the mesh. Uh, same with texture map. So if you have a texture map turned on down here, this is gonna be remembered when you save a tool or a project. And if you have polypin information, it's gonna be remembered as well. So you don't have to do anything different with that. Now, if you export it out, um, that's when your only difference would be if you're exporting out to say an STL or an OBJ. But if you're saving a ZTL or a ZBrush project file, it's gonna retain any texture maps you have linked to that subtool and also any vertex color or polypane information you have on that subtool as well. So you don't have to do anything special. Uh, Wavy Gravy is asking, is there any way to import raw scan data like high resolution point clouds? So unfortunately not point clouds. Um, if you get the point clouds converted, you can definitely import them in. Um, but for just the raw point clouds, no. We do, there are plugins that we have that will accept PLY format and other things like that. But for raw point clouds, no. You need to have uh, triangles along with those points in order for ZBrush to import it. All right, well thank you all for coming out and I hope this helps. And if you have any other uh, questions on stuff like this, you can hit up our uh, Ask Zebra stuff on Twitter too. I try, I'm backlogged right now on those, but hopefully I'm gonna try to get some of those done this week as well. Um, program selections for your point clouds. Uh, one, um, what is it called? Um, let me think here. Mesh Lab uh, has some stuff in it and that's free. You can download it. Uh, that has some processes to commit point clouds and turn them into stuff. Um, most of the stuff that handles point clouds too often usually has a process that will allow you to export out to geometry data. Um, it just depends what it is. But there are some other applications. The only one I think about the hand is Mesh Lab. Um, but it's been a while since I've converted a point cloud. All right, thank you all. 
and stay safe. And until next time, Paul, I believe, is streaming uh, Saul's tomorrow, and then Paul will be on Friday, and then Dice K will be coming on early, early Japan time on Monday. And I will be back next week. So thank you all, and stay safe. Happy ZBrushing.